Torej lep pozdrav vsem skupaj. Zadovoljni smo, da vam lahko danes predstavim na profesorja Kniživiča, ki je že več kot 25 let v Ameriki, sicer njegova provinilca je iz Belograda, ampak je praktično so svoje izobraževanje v pravo v Združenih državah Amerike. Trenutno dela na univerzi v Nebraski, njegovo delo obsega tako raziskave, kot pedagoško delo, kot tudi extension, se pravi svetovanje. Lahko tudi rečem, da v Nebraski kjer je, da danes, kaj druzga razen GSO, ko ruze ne poznajo, niti svoje, tudi ko rovali takši, skratka je sredi GSO-jo. Je tudi dokaz, da lahko tudi nekdo, ki se ukvarja z delom na terenu, uspešil v smislu našega točkovanja in ciklisov, ima v pobrečo več kot pet člankov letno in verjetno tudi več kot tisoč citatov. Ukvarja se, kot sem že dejal, z večinoma s herbologijo in preko te herbologije se seveda seznamo tudi z gensko spremenjenimi neorganizmi oziroma organizmi. V tem primeru koruzo, odporno na glifosat, sodeluje pri tem projektu od samega začetka. Vedno je tisti, ki najbolj, ne bom zdaj rekel, provocira, ampak tudi debatera z vsemi predstavniki Monsanta iz različnih predelov in so več prav ti predstavniki potem zaradi njegovih vprašanj in pa diskusije tudi v predsejšnji zagati. Vsem skupaj se zavljujem, da ste prišli. Thank you also to Steven to come to Slovenia to give us opportunity to hear his opinion and please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andre. That was quite a long introduction. I thought maybe you're going to give a talk instead of being here. So. <laughs> I've given this presentation so many times, so uh, uh, actually, let me officially say Dobar dan. Ja sem rođen v Belgradu, ali sem otešel iz Jodrovske v Staroj Jugoslaviji, v doba, kad smo svi bili titovi pioniri, vse sem se toga dola ali sem otišel iz Jugoslovije odavno, tako da je spok ima nekaj 26-27 godina. Basically, what I'm going to do here, I'll give you a brief, I'll give you a brief overview of some of the issues and experiences with herbicide stolen crops. Herbicide stolen crops are just a part of the GMO package. You know, they are, they've been modified so you can use only certain herbicides for, for, weed, for weed control. Everything that I'm going to share with you here today is not really new. You know, I published several manuscripts and you can see some years here. We're going way back to 2002, 2003. The most recent publication that came out in Medica Journal is in 2007. And, uh, a lot of information here is my own experience because in Nebraska I'm working in research and in extension and uh, I don't know whether I should say we're pretty fortunate in the United States with our system you know the scientists have a chance to work uh, closely with the producers so as part of my job and, and my uh, extension activities I do have a chance to see what are the problems that the farmers have there literally on a daily basis. In my institute, the farmer will bring his tractor with a sprayer and leave it outside and he has boots on it and everything. He's going to walk into my office. He just had a question to ask. So this is just to show you how the American system works, you know, how the extension works. So as a scientist, as a scientist, we have a great opportunity to work closely with the producers and actually try to solve, you know, to solve their, uh, their problems. So, this issue of uh, herbicide tolerant crops uh, has been a, a pretty hot topic all over, all over the world. In the United States, it's not a new thing anymore. You know, people are used to it and they accept the GMO crops. So we live with GMO crops. And, but it's still a hot topic in different parts of the world and uh, as you can see there, I've, I've given many presentations on this topic all over, all over the world. In, in some parts, they even use my uh, literature and my presentation 
uh, during their uh, legislature process. And if anybody is interested in reading some of this literature, I have my business cards here. If you type Steve Knesvick University of Nebraska on Google, you'll find me. You'll, find, you'll get probably about a couple hundred kid hits or so. You can always drop me, drop me an email and I can send you a PDF, PDF file of my, of my presentation. Speaking of GMO crops, and this is again a, a picture from United States, uh, they are generally accepted in U.S. Uh, we have uh, herbicide tolerant soybeans, that's what HD stands for. Herbicide tolerant soybeans in the United States is pretty much planted over, I would say, 95% of soybean acres. Uh, in U.S., we grow about 80 to 85 million acres of soybeans. So 95% of that is is a herbicide tolerant soybean, which is primarily around the British soybeans. We have some uh, Liberty Link, uh, Liberty Link soybeans, but this is all primarily around the British. If you look more on some of the other other crops, uh, and this slide actually it's not quite up to date. You know, it goes up to 2006, 2006. Uh, the uh, around the uh, actually the around the pretty co uh, uh, corn is not even on this on this on this slide, but it will be right now it will be probably somewhere like this green line so this bt cotton and, and round the pretty slash bt corn is about about on the same on the same level basically what i'm trying to show with this slide is that you know we're having a steady steady increase in the adoption of of uh, of, of gmo gmo crops in in the united states so uh and uh what else is what else is out there when it comes down to uh, to uh, GMO crops? You've seen around the pretty soybean is number one. Around the pretty cotton will be number two. That's in about sixty percent of acres. Around the pretty corn uh, uh, or Liberty Link corn slash BP BP corn, which is for uh, for insect resistance. Uh, that would be like number three in some parts. We have around the pretty canola or Liberty Link canola or rapeseed. So, uh, so that's all on the uh, the agronomic side. And basically, the way the corporations work in the United States, especially Monsanto, they do have around the pretty genes. They want to make as much money as possible. That's the name of the game. So basically, what they're doing, they'll come to you and they'll say, okay. You have good hybrids and everything. We'll give you this Roundup Ready gene and we'll put it in all of your hybrids. In return, you're going to pay me for that. You know, you're not going to pay me just once. You're going to pay every year. Every time you sell your seed with my gene in it, you have to pay for the tech fee. And uh, that's basically the name of the game. So here we are now. Uh, they're putting Roundup Ready genes, or trying to put around the pretty gene into all kinds of crops over there. So uh, we have around the pretty alpha alpha. Uh, it was released in 2005. It was a slow sale, and then uh, they had it in 2006. And then alpha alpha is an open pollinated species. The pollen can move with the wind, with the air, and so forth. With the insects, you know, these bees, bumblebees, and whatever, they'll come and play on this plants and they'll fly a mile or two away or whatever, you know, and land and carry the pollen and their wings and their legs and whatever. So there were some issues that round the British gene was shown in organically grown alpha alpha and in organically and a conventional alpha, you know, non-GMO alpha alpha. So if you're an organic producer and you're selling organic soybean on the world market for a premium price, and all of a sudden your customers from Europe or from Japan or whatever find the traces around the uh, uh, ready gene in their, uh, in their organic alpha, alpha. Hey, that's not organic alpha anymore. So make a long story short, because of the issue with pollen, you know, uh, the uh, USDA, which is the United States Department of Agriculture, put a stop on Roundup, Roundup Ready Alpha Alpha. So, uh, and then the next example is Roundup Ready Turf. Americans like to play golf, you know, uh, and Tiger Woods and all those guys, and the golf is a big business. You know, they spend a lot of, a lot of money on, on maintaining golf courses. So, uh, the company put a Roundup Ready gene in some of the turf, turf grass species but that was never released and the issue again is the pollen movement and actually cross-pollination between the grassy species and some of the wild grassy relatives. 
And the list goes on and on. Around the pretty spring wheat. It was developed in Canada. Uh, uh, they worked with the actually federal scientists in Canada, with Ag Canada. I have some friends in Canada that worked uh, on, this, on this particular issue. They developed it, they were ready to release it, but Canadian or wheat producers said, thank you, we don't want brown or pretty spring wheat because our market, our buyers from Japan or Europe said, we're not gonna buy Canadian wheat if it's round or pretty, we just want conventional wheat. So this is the example how the growers, the growers actually uh, told the government even if you approve uh, ground up ready wheat in Canada, you know we're not gonna we don't want to buy it. You know so uh, so anyway, and because of the same reasons, you know the spring wheat was never marketed in the United States. We do have another type of uh, herbicide tolerant wheat in, in U.S., which is called clear clear field or any any tolerant uh, wheat, and and that is uh, that's been sold uh, for the last six or seven years six to seven years. So yeah, we don't have around the pretty wheat, we have a clear field wheat, but it's grown on a relatively limited acres and only in certain uh, certain areas of the country. It's not widely uh, it's not widely widely used. As you can see the list goes and on goes on and on. Like I said earlier, these companies are in the business of making money. They have Roundup. This Roundup Pretty gene is probably the most profitable gene that was ever made you know in the last in the last 10 years. And uh, so here we are, Roundup Ready sugar beets. Sugar beet is a crop that's not as short. You guys don't know what sugar beet looks like. It's not very competitive against the weeds. You know, they spend a lot of money for, uh, for controlling weeds and sugar beets. And uh, so they, they developed sugar beets and it's still, still in, uh, in testing. Uh, the latest word on it is that they might be releasing sugar beets in the United States probably in the next couple of years. The flip coin of sugar beets uh, as a GMO is the sugar industry. Uh, the sugar factory said, uh, at this time, we don't want to accept Roundup Ready sugar beets because we don't want to put a label on the bag of sugar that says this sugar was produced from you know, Roundup Ready or, or some kind of uh, you know, GMO sugar beet. So this is the example where actually the public can say, hey, you know, maybe we don't want to have sugar from the crop, you know, that has those genes inside. Uh, here is the newest trend in the last few years. Up to about three or four years ago, we had what we call double stack or triple stack, where you have two or three trays in a crop. So, and it, usually one trait was for herbicide resistant and another trait was for insect resistant, like BT. So what we have in this case here, uh, now the, new, uh, the newest uh, uh, stack that Monsanto is working on is adding a trait for another herbicide. We're having problems with Roundup Ready uh, crops in certain parts of the United States. It's not widespread. But it, it, it's, it's, becoming, it's becoming a pretty problematic in some, part, in some parts of the United States, and I'll get, I'll get to that later. So basically what the industry is doing now, they're saying, okay, we have a problem with glyphosate and glyphosate resistance. Oh, why don't we try to develop a gene that will give these plants tolerance to some other herbicides, some other herbicides. So there is the... Uh, uh, and the example of that would be a dicamba, which is another, which, which is another herbicide. Also, uh, we have a double stack of like a Liberty Link soybeans and Liberty Link corn, and then also BT corn, you know, combined combined with uh, for the use with, with Liberty herbicide. And then the Pioneer company is jumping on the bandwagon, like everybody in the United States is jumping on the bandwagon. Actually, if you want to really make good money and be a professor and a researcher in the area that has a lot of money for research, is to be in the field of biotech. And, uh, and then sometimes the rest of us get a little bit jealous of that. You know how it goes between the sciences. Some fields get funded more than others, you know. And, but still, if you're a creative scientist, you can always find some funding, funding out there. But the biotech is definitely the area. When there's there's all kinds of all kinds of research research money in that area, so 
The, uh, so the other companies are, are following the same trend. Uh, Pioneer is right now, it's a Pioneer DuPont, is right now working on having a double stack for two herbicides for glyphosate resistance and then also for ALS, ALS resistant for a group of uh, chemistries like where we have uh, a different imidazolinum type chemistries pursuit and all that and that doesn't really matter to you but basically the point here is that there might be crops that you can use a couple of different type herbicides uh, you know in it uh, from the, the, the genetic modification standpoint. So you will think alright so now we have two herbicides and maybe one insecticide and there's guys over there that work in the real world agriculture they're saying Oh, maybe we can tolerate one, two, three of those traits. But I guess that's not the end of the story. Again, these companies are driven by the profits, by the shareholders. They're going to make money to shareholders every year. If they don't, the guy pulls his money from that company and goes to another company. That's unfortunately one of the, uh, could be called advantages or in some cases disadvantages of the, uh, of the market or in the capitalism. So, we have now a company, Dow, Dow Herbicides or Dow Agro uh, company is coming up uh, with a hybrid that's going to have eight stacks in it. So it's going to be a, a hybrid with eight traits in it. It's going to be three or four traits for herbicide resistance and it's going to be another four or so for insect, insect resistance. So you're going to have this plant that has, uh, that has traits, you know, for, for eight different things over there. So basically, basically, uh, you know, and they call that a smart, smart stack. So I guess with this, uh, I think I'm pretty much, yeah, I'm pretty much done with the, uh, with the uh, in general introduction, like what is going on in the United States in the area where biotechnology is used for weed control. You know the bottom line is that they keep adding these, adding these these genes, and uh, and there are different reasons for that, and I'm gonna I'm gonna come to that later on as we go through. Okay, so here we are now. I'm here sitting in the audience, listening to presenters. You know, listening to these marketing marketing companies that market all these things. So what do I get as a producer? I'm a farmer. After all. I'm the one that's paying for all of this because quite frankly these tech fees they don't come free you know they don't come free uh, for Roundup Ready soybeans you're paying about ten dollars an acre which is probably somewhere about 25 bucks 30 bucks a hectare uh, you know so every bag of seeds that's sold you know if you're using depending on the size of your bags and whatever you know, if you're using two bags per hectare or, or three bags or four bags, actually in our area it's typically about a bag and a half per acre. Anyway, so, uh, so but the, the bottom line, the conversion is about, uh, about 25, 25 to 30 bucks a hectare. What do farmers get out of it? These are, these are some of the definite benefits of herbicide tolerant crops. And these are actually some of the, uh, the reasons why a lot, of farmers, a lot of farmers went for this technology. Roundup doesn't cause any uh, physical injuries on the plants, like what we have with some other, with some other uh, post timber type herbicides. So you can spray a Roundup, a Roundup uh, or, or different types of, of glyphosate. Glyphosate is the active ingredient inside Roundup on just about any, any growth stage uh, from the time of crop emergence to about a flowering, flowering stage or so. So there's, there, there's definitely an increased margin of crop, of crop safety. Roundup is also a uh, non-selected herbicide. It doesn't have any residual activity. You can literally spray today and come back tomorrow and plant your crop while your weeds are dying or so. So basically there's no any issues with the uh, uh, with uh, recropping and all that, and it also has you know a pretty good activity on all kinds of uh, perennial, perennial issues. So basically, with this, co I covered both the point two and point three, and then uh, this technology it's really simple to use. In the United States, um, in Nebraska, at least I can speak for my. For my state, average farm size is about 1,800 acres. That's about 
uh, 800 hectares, something like that. It's about eight, seven, 800 hectares is an average farm size. There are guys that are smaller, but there are also guys that are bigger. So if you have, you know, two, three thousand acres, two, three thousand acres, or two, three thousand hectares, and uh, you have to go out and, and you have like a feet, and the fields are big, you know, you can have fields that are easily, easily about 300, 400, 500, uh, 500 acres, uh, individual fields, and you have to go out and you spray these herbicides, you know, uh, within a day or two, or if it gets rain, you have to wait longer or whatever. You know, with some other herbicides, there might be some issues. Some issues, you, you have to wait for the growth stage and everything. You know, but this is this is pretty uh, pretty simple technology, pretty simple technology, and I think the number four is probably one of the main reasons why this technology uh, was that well accepted in the United States. <coughs> Another benefit that the producer that these producers had, and I'm saying had, I don't think they have that benefit anymore, but at the beginning. When this technology started, I'm talking about 96, 97, 98, that's when they started pushing, uh, pushing uh, uh, Roundup Ready uh, really crops pretty hard. At that time, the cost of weed control in soybean was pretty high. So when they came up with Roundup Ready soybeans, the price of glyphosate was relatively low. It was uh, relatively inexpensive. Actually, glyphosate is a fantastic chemical but it's a fantastically cheap to make that chemical too. You know, so originally, if you look in the 95, 96 at that time, you know, as a farmer, instead of spending 100 bucks per hectare, all of a sudden your cost of control, weed control is down to 20, you know, 20 bucks a hectare or so. So obviously, you know, farmers are like us. We have to watch how, unfortunately, you know, we are all, we all have to work for a living and support our families and everything. So the farmers are watching how much money they're spending and everything. So, so this is another reason why actually they went for Roundup Ready crops because at that time, you know, they were easy to use and they were relatively, relatively inexpensive. However, in 2002, a patent for glyphosate expired and everybody can make glyphosates nowadays. A lot of that stuff comes out of China, out of India, uh, down in uh, South America and uh, and then uh, created a high demand for it so the prices of glyphosate started slowly creeping up and basically last year the price of glyphosate doubled this year the price of glyphosate stayed about the same like last year but they increased the tech fee so when you look at the tech fee when you look at the price of glyphosate and everything so here we are now back to that, you know, $80, $80, $80 per So I'm saying right now, you know, the farmers don't really have that much benefit of planting these crops. So I'm trying to paint you a picture here, guys, why United States farmers, you know, accepted all this, this technology. And then at that time, we had issues with atrazine resistance. Uh, United States still uses atrazine. Uh, I heard that you guys are still using atrazine here in Slovenia. You don't or not? You don't. Okay, you don't. All right. Uh, the uh, I know that uh, many European countries uh, stopped using atrazine 20 or 30 years ago. So, uh, but uh, you know, we had a lot of issues with triazine resistance, a lot of issues with some other types of resistance. So having uh, uh, a situation where you can spray glyphosate across your field and killing these or uh, you know resistant weeds. You know, it was a good welcome sign. Welcome sign. So I guess this is me speaking as a pro producer, producer in front of in front of you. So, so those are some of the reasons. Some of the reasons why why uh, uh, producers went for it. However, now after using this for so many for so many this technology for so many years. You know, we are actually seeing to uh, uh, beginning to see some other some other sides of this of this whole of this whole story about about GMO. You know, the producers, like I said, they're paying a tech fee every year. This is not a one-time deal. You have to pay a tech fee every year because. 
That is considered an intellectual property of the company that sells this. So every hybrid that they put this gene in, like in the United States, we grow probably anywhere from 80 to 100, 120 different soybean hybrids, about the same number of, of corn hybrids. So every one of those hybrids, if there is a Roundup Ready gene in it, or a Liberty Link gene in it, or a BT gene in it, on the price of the seed, you have to add the cost of those, uh, of those, uh, those trades. So uh, now, after 10 years of having this technology, you know, the industry is now coming up with more and more of these genes, as I mentioned that right from the beginning. So if you want to buy a corn with the eight stacks in it, you have to pay for each one of those eight stacks. So the critics of GMO and the critics of this, uh, this technology are now saying, wait a minute, I'm a producer, why do I need eight stacks in my corn? You know, and some guys are saying, oh, you need eight stacks if you have eight problems in your field. And the guy says, I don't have eight problems in my field, I don't want to pay for eight stacks. You know, and this eight stack technology is just beginning. It's not out there spread, widely spread. So a lot of producers are complaining uh, openly now about this. They're saying, hey, wait a minute. Are you guys just using this eight stack or whatever and getting your money selling me something that I don't really need? You know, and so now American producers are slowly realizing what's going on, you know, what's going on with this, uh, this and then on the other side, the industry that markets this, they're saying, hey, I know you don't need eight stacks, but do you need a health insurance? Yeah, you need health insurance. You guys have a nationalized health insurance here, so you don't have to worry about it. I'm using an example of health insurance. You know, okay, you need a car insurance. You know, everybody needs a car insurance, but you can pick and choose what level of car insurance you need. So, so this is the same marketing strategies that they're using now for, for these crops. They're saying, yeah, these eight stacks is your insurance in case you need, you know, this, the, uh, this particular trait or that particular trait. And then other guys are saying, wait a minute, but that's a hell of expensive, you know, that's a hell of an expensive, expensive insurance. So anyway, so those are, those are some of the, uh, the issues that are, that are beginning to surface the surface in in, uh, in, in US uh, when it's related to this technology. All right, what is the benefit of the industry that makes and sells this? Instead of putting all these sentences up there, I could have just put a dollar sign. I mean, we all know, it's, a lot of that is about money. Basically, what has happened in the United States in the last 10 years or so, the pesticides industry, all these big corporations, I don't need to name any of the companies, I'm sure you guys know, uh, know uh, many of those companies. You know, these companies went after the seed industry and they literally bought the seed industry. There is only a very small percent of uh, seed industry in the United States that it's uh, not owned by the, big, uh, by the big corporations. So basically, what they've done, you know, the pesticides industry took the seed industry, they control the seed industry. And they're using that seed now as a vehicle to deliver their trades on the market. It's actually a very smart business for them. It may not be for us, but it might be, it's a very smart, you know, business for the, uh, for the pesticides industry. So, because they know that we have to buy seeds. You want to produce food, guys? You have to buy seeds to put them in the ground.